Uh, the program I that you're about to see is what's really attracting you, and it's my uh, a privilege simply to introduce uh, the host for this evening, uh, the remarkable Anna Devere Smith, uh, who, who needs really no introduction. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm also blocking her, which I shouldn't do, which shows that I have not had any kind of theatrical experience. Uh, to say nothing of actually having invented an art form that only I would be known for. Uh, Anna is extraordinary, uh, and ADS Works, Anna Devere Smith Works at Aspen is something that we are incredibly proud of. What she does is take her, her extraordinary, inimitable passion about social justice and changing the world in positive ways, using art to do that. And uh, the programs she's done have been remarkable, and you will see more and more of what she does in the future. Uh, it's, it's uh, I think, somewhat ironic to be in a room like this where usually priceless things are bid on over here. And I can tell you that Anna is priceless but the Aspen Institute has her, so there are no possibilities of, of any of you bidding for uh, her remarkable services in the future. So, uh, and I should also say that she not only runs ADS Works at the Institute, which means nominally she's w uh, running one of our 30 policy programs, uh, but she's also a trustee uh, of the Aspen Institute. We're very proud of that as well. So it is my pleasure to introduce Anna Devere Smith. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elliot. Thank you so much. And I'm, I'm just so pleased to be here um, at Christie's. This is really the launch of what we hope will be a, uh, a fruitful relationship with, uh, between Christie's and the Aspen Institute. This extraordinary room and to see you all here. It, don't you feel nice and safe in here compared to outside? <laughs> and some flimsy kind of place we could be. So, um, so uh, let me just say a few words about the panelists. They're, they're all... Uh, in the bio, but just so we're, we're, could you please turn off your cell phones? <laughs> um, so Nick Anderer is the executive chef and partner at Maialino, uh, which, um, how many of you have been to Maialino? And how many of you love it? Okay. Um, uh, well, no, well, I guess you could. You could love the idea of it. Uh, at one of Danny Meyer's um, extraordinary ventures. So um, Nick got his BA in art history from Columbia University, fell in love with Italian food while studying abroad at Trinity College's Rome campus. His culinary career began at Buzzy O'Keefe's Water Club. He then worked for uh, Larry Forgione, I got that, uh, Larry Forgione and served as a line cook at Batali's Babo. Can you get us a reservation? <laughs> which Maybe. fueled his passion for Italian uh, cuisine. Andrew eventually came to the Gramercy Tavern where he cooked for six years before opening Maialino in 2009. Would you please help me welcoming Nick Andrew into the Aspen community. <laughs> Elizabeth Strab is a MacArthur Fellow and member of New York City Mayor's Cultural Affairs Advisory Commission. She's the author of Streb, How to Become an Extreme Action Hero. And in 2003, she established the Streb Lab for Action Mechanics in Brooklyn. Streb's One Extraordinary Day was commissioned for presentation at London 2012 in the uh, cult Cultural Olympiad for the Summer Games. And um, a film has just been, uh, had its opening at South by South, its victorious opening at South by South Southwest directed by Catherine Gund, and uh, let's welcome Strep. Well, she's been to Aspen before. Thanks. And Professor Arden Reed is the Arthur M. Dole and Fanny Dole Professor of English at Pomona College, was trained in comparative literature, and is an expert in 19th century English and French literature and 19th century painting. He is also prominent in the field of contemporary art criticism. His latest book, Slow Art, is forthcoming from the University of California Press with a French translation to follow. And the other thing that's really significant about, uh, about Professor Reed is he's the reason we're here today. He and I, um, in the fall, uh, on a Sunday, uh, got in before the Guggenheim opened uh, and were able to see James Terrell's uh, wonder. How many of you saw the wonderful? Yes. And, um, and uh, then we went and had a slow coffee uh, <laughs> down the street at the Noya Gallery Cafe. 
And when he was talking to me, and he has over the last couple of years, his idea of slow art, it actually um, became interesting to me because of my interest in actually in social change, which is quite slow, usually, very <laughs> slow, very slow. And also because what, um, what social change counts on and what art that would like to be a part of making positive change counts on is for an audience to be in full participation and uh, to, to, to not be uh, at just a, you know, a, an observer from the outside, but to really engage. So I thought, you know, this, this idea that, that Arden's talking about, and he'll say much more about it, um, I think it actually has something to do with an engaged citizenry, citizenry in this way. So um, I want to just say a few things about each of the uh, areas of ideas that we will have here, because I want you to start thinking, speaking of an engaged citizenry, the conversation part of this will be very important. Um, so for example, in a draft of slow art, um, these are a couple of the things that were compelling to me from Arden's book. I don't know if it's still going to be in the book, but this was a draft you gave me a couple years ago. It'll these, be on the cover now. It'll be on the cover. <laughs> some, some really, 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 really interesting ideas. So, so this is on the side of slow, okay? We're going to have a debate. This is on the side of slow. So here um, he writes, speed also influences the experience of everyday life. Elevator rage is how James Gleick, Gleick characterizes our time, referring to the anger generated by having to wait in the lobby. A good waiting time is in the neighborhood of 15 seconds, he says in Faster, the Acceleration of Just About Everything. Sometime around 40 seconds, people start to get visibly upset. His study is filled with evidence like amphetamines, adrenaline rush, narcotic rush, or changes in smokers' habits over the 20th century, switching from pipes to cigarettes. And he has a number of examples like that, getting to something this serious. Quoting Paul Virilio. This is Arden quoting Paul. Speed is war, the last war. There is no time for heads of state to negotiate because technology, technological advances have reduced the warning for nuclear war to less than a minute. Diplomacy is displaced by automated defense systems. It follows that to disarm would thus mean to decelerate, okay? So that's on the side of slow. Now we're gonna go to fast. Fast is Elizabeth. Well, uh, the, the, we, it won't have to be. Okay, so this is from an interview that I did of Elizabeth uh, like about a month and a half ago on the subject of grace. Now, Elizabeth's work, how many of you have seen Elizabeth's extraordinary work? Oh, I'm so glad. Okay, so you know what she does. They jump through glass in London. They jumped off the Tower of London. So she's been the bad boy in the so-called dance world, world. She calls herself an action person, okay. Of dancers, of ballet dancers, and I asked Damien Wetzel to stay around to respond. The thing is that they won't land. They won't land, and they don't wanna land. And they never land, and the circus people never land. They leave out the, absolutely, the absolute truth that action, they leave out what may be the deepest part of the drama of action for movement, landing. The other thing they don't do, they camouflage gravity, and they have lots of fancy ways to do it, and they call that grace. They call that grace. My thing is, what they leave out, Anna, is force. What force does to time, what force does to space, what force does to the body, they leave that out. And the extension of force, or the exaggeration of force, that Streb utilizes now in motors, now in machines that move, now with machines that move, now, not just that I have an elevated platform with a grid that I can balance on so that I can be at 20 feet above the, gr above the ground, now I'm whipping around 20 feet above the ground. <laughs> okay, so that's strip. And that's about, that's, about, that's about accepting gravity but working with force to get speed. And lastly, um, you know, Nick, uh, I've been interested in the whole idea of slow food for a very long time, since the 90s when I first interviewed Alice Waters, who's considered one of the godmothers of it. And I think in the case of Nick, there's, 
what he's representing for us is his ideas, but also a whole huge movement about how we eat and what we eat and where it comes from and how it's cooked. And just today, Linda Lair, who's one of my colleagues at, uh, at Aspen, just yesterday, told me about this article. Did you see it in the Times? Better Eating with Smart Scales and Forks. And there is a $99 utensil, the Happy Fork. The Happy Fork. This $99.99 utensil turns an accusatory red and vibrates if there's not a pause of roughly 10 seconds between each time you bring the fork to your mouth. Right? So, so we're really, Nick, you're really a, a part of a big movement about slowing down everything about eating. So with all that said, well, uh, do you get that's electrocuted? Our, that's our, huh? Does it, is it a light or do you actually get electrocuted? <laughs> He didn't make it. It's, oh. it's in the Times. Oh, okay. You can buy this thing for $99.99. So that, I wanted you to hear this context of why we're here together with this disparate group of people and what we'll all be talking about. And Arden is going to start us off with um, slow art. <laughs> I thought when I had 10 minutes um, that I would start with a little exercise that I do in all of my seminars at Pomona. I don't know how this came to me, but years ago I thought, I want to make a distinction between the world that all of us have come to before we get to the seminar table uh, and what happens in the space of that room. So I wanted it to be distinct. And I also wanted people to realize that they came into the seminar room not just with their minds, but they came in as embodied creatures. So I said, I want to try this little breathing experiment. And you'll think it's very woo-woo. Uh, and very new age, and you all will think you're being infantilized, right? And actually, there are some of my students who are smiling, right? You will, you will testify whether this is true or not. Uh, so I said, I just invite you to try this once, and if you don't like it, we won't do it anymore. But I invite you all to, and you can do this if you like, to sit up very straight, both feet on, on the floor. Imagine that uh, your spine is elongated, your shoulders are sort of back, so your chest can be open. And I'm going to, I use there, um, in classes, I use a little gong from Tassajara. Here, my cousin Marsha has given me a, uh, a little bicycle <laughs> bell. <laughs> That'll do just as well. So what we do is, if you feel like it, to close your eyes, and for about 30 seconds, just breathe and notice whatever is going on. And then I ring the bell again, and, and we start class. And maybe we'll, <laughs> we'll start the slides tonight, and maybe we won't. So, OK. <laughs> So, all right, everybody is sitting, shoulders back, spine up, feet down. Okay, so about 30 seconds we'll breathe. Well, I don't think I've ever been in a room in New York that's so quiet. <laughs> uh, thank you. Okay, are we go? All right. Um, so, for me, the challenge here is going to be, sorry, not kicking Elizabeth. Can we stop this? Please. This, this is slow. Later we'll get to fast. Okay, the challenge is going to be holding on to the microphone, paper, and thank you and something to click with, but I'll try. OK. Oh, that would be terrific. Great idea. Thank Do you. I press the red button? No, I think you press the, the right hand one, OK? Unless you want to intervene. <laughs> that would be the red button. <laughs> OK. Um, I begin with a word about speed and slowness. For all their manifest differences, the two are actually twins. Each makes it possible for us to experience the other. For one thing, we can have no palpable sense of slow without a memory of how fast feels. More, fast arts and slow arts are twins because they both make us conscious of the passing of time. So here's the real divide. On one hand, aesthetic media in which time is invisible, never rising into conscious awareness. With most Hollywood films, time goes unremarked. In fact, the test of entertainment means you're not looking at your watch. On the other hand, art in which the tempo, whether fast or slow, calls direct attention to itself, makes itself integral to the work. Example, 
The Scottish filmmaker Douglas Gordon a few years ago stretched Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho until it ran for 24 hours. Did anybody ever see part of that? It was shown at, at MoMA? Okay. So, first please. So, in response, an LA filmmaker named Daniel Martinico produced a 24 second Psycho. Okay. But we have to stop that now and move on to something else. We can't, we don't have time to finish it. Thank you. Um, now there's another slide that's supposed to come up. Um, so, my slow creds. That's it. Good. You're too fast. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, my, my credentials as somebody who, who's here to talk about slowness. I've been doing it for 30 years this year. And the way it started was with some old friends in Cambridge looking at this triptych by Max Beckmann called The Actors, 1942. And I had never studied art history at all. Um, but we looked at this thing and I had an unusual experience. I had, in graduate school, studied texts very closely and I loved complicated texts that, that were endlessly available to unravel. And I looked at this enormous painting and I saw immediately that it had all of the complexity that a Mallarmé sonnet might have. But in addition to that, it had this enormous scale, it had color, it had facture. You had to relate to it with your body. So it was like I was getting all of the intellectual juice that I got from doing a Baudelaire prose poem, but also this sense of an embodied experience. And it was powerful enough that it eventually pivoted my whole work so that I switched from writing literary criticism to doing things with the visual arts. Um, so that's my practice, but we're here to talk about larger issues, about social change. And I think there are two practical reasons why slowing down matters. The first is that the average American spends between six and 10 seconds with any given work. I mean, you can test it out right in this room. You know, how long do you want to dwell on, on each one? That's a problem because art, generally speaking, does not give itself away instantaneously. Somebody asked the artist Ed Ruscha, how can you tell good art from bad? And Ruscha had a great answer. He said, with bad art, you look at it and you immediately say, wow. And then you look again and you say, hmm, maybe not. With good art, it's the opposite. So the question is, accustomed as we are to instant gratification, how do we find the composure for sustained looking? And that's really the subject of, of the book that Anna mentioned, that I may tell you I've been in the, working on it for about 10 years, so it's, it's earned its adjective slow. But there's a second claim that I want to make that's a stronger claim in favor of slow looking. And this in, entails cultural history. So you all know that for the past couple hundred years, there have been revolutions in transportation, manufacturing, the flow of information, of capital, of bodies. And all that together has accelerated the pace of people's lived experience in unprecedented ways. And I think that experiencing speed beyond our control leads people to seek breathers, breaks, oases. Then, at the same time that culture was accelerating, society was becoming secularized. So what's the result that you get? That traditional practices like religious contemplation grow constricted. Under those circumstances, and you can see where I'm going, I think that experiencing art might take the place of those older sacred practices. In other words, sometimes old wine comes in new wineskins. I'll give you two examples, one very brief, one a little longer. Next, please. Okay, um, Drew, my partner, I just happened to be in in uh, Amsterdam a couple of years ago and went into the Neue Kerke, the 17th century church, where they had on display, as you can see, Andy Warhol's double pink Last Supper. Uh, I think this would be interesting to talk about, but I don't want to spend the time to do it now, so we'll move on to the next slide, please. Um, a story by Don DeLillo registers the persistence of sacred viewing habits in a pedestrian and unlikely place. The Angel Esmeralda, the name of the story, is about two nuns who work in the South Bronx. Among their parishioners is a 12-year-old girl named Esmeralda who is raped and tossed from the roof to her death. At the end, 
elderly sister Edgar follows crowds to stare at a billboard. After 20 minutes of waiting, the headlights of a passing commuter train, I'm quoting, hit the dimmest part of the billboard, and a face appeared, and it belonged to the murdered girl, close quote. So is this apparition just a freakish coincidence? Are we supposed to pity this superstitious crowd who find no better way to grieve? I think that would be too easy, and I think DeLillo is hinting at something deeper. Sister Edgar has a younger colleague who admonishes her. Don't pray to pictures, pray to saints. In her view, the crowd has witnessed no miracle. It's just, quote, the poor need visions, close quote. Now, the story's heart lies in Edgar's answer. You say the poor, but who else would saints appear to? The saints and angels appear to bank presidents? Eat your carrots. I grant you, it's wacky and maybe a little pathetic that a vision should appear when train lights hit a gigantic billboard selling orange juice. But indeed, how else would angels appear? Because one way or another, all of us are poor. I really do believe this. We all need visions. Next, please. Um, and I think that has something to do with this epidemic of slow practices. Um, this cultural and social longing and that's produced a kind of epidemic. And I have tons of examples, but I will spare you in the, in the sake of time, for the sake of time, almost all of them. But of course, it all began, as Anna was saying, with the slow food movement. But there's been a, an explosion of slow-themed practices recently, from scholarship to sustainable investments to sex. Uh, this is a video that Norwegian television audiences watched in record numbers it lasts seven hours, and all that it does is it shows a train going from Oslo to Bergen. Uh, President Obama himself got into the act. He remarked on an impatience that characterizes Washington, an attention span that's only grown shorter with a 24-hour news cycle. When a crisis hits, everyone responds to the moment until the media coverage has moved on instead of confronting the real challenges. Sure, you could say this craze for things slow is a fad, but I think slowness will endure because these practices spring from enduring needs, from our poverty. But the last thing I want to say, and it, it dovetails with Anna's interest in social change, is how do you practice slowness? And that's what I've been thinking about this year. Uh, and I have a kind of credo, and that is that I want museum visitors to understand that they already possess what they need for having meaningful encounters with artworks. Whether or not they have any particular talent, art education, technical vocabulary, it doesn't matter. What they bring is life experiences and a pair of eyes. In a nutshell, deep looking requires only two things. First, trusting your eye to lead you to something engaging, and then investing time once you have found that real right thing. And when you do, when you're looking, for instance, as a painting, it may turn into a moving picture. So I have some uh, other things that maybe later we can look at that will be living examples of slowness, but I've taken up my time and more. Thank you. <laughs> my objective was to puncture the skyline of London in a way that people would uh, not believe, um, be surprised about, happen upon, and also remember uh, for their whole lives. In the Streb Lab for Action Mechanics, we experiment with the idea of extreme action. More force, more velocity, more risk. I think my original belief and desire is to see a human being fly. Watch them fly! Go! Oh, jeez. We were really in touch with how to keep ourselves safe. 
I think you have to get beyond the barrier of self-protection before you can really fly. I believed that I could do anything. Part of the deal is you walk into the room and you agree to get hurt. You might get a little hurt. It's like being invincible. And then suddenly, just one time. You would have never thought that that moment was going to cause such an injury, but it did. She wanted something bigger. I was scared out of my wits. Don't hit the bridge. There is magic. It doesn't exist everywhere. So you do have to catch it when it comes. You can't ignore it. You do need to believe in it. doesn't sound safe. Anything that's too safe is not action. Um, thoughts on fast and the criticality of extreme action. One, if you are lying on the ground and looking up at a rectangular skylight and clouds and birds are going past this frame, you are tallying the physical and temporal and spatial information as best as you are able, <clears throat> perceptually. However, is a tree moving? Its branches, all you can see, are not traveling. They may be moving. Is that meta-movement? The clouds are both traveling and moving, more profound. Then a small bird goes by, faster than a small bird flies, at least in my experience. Maybe it's a large bird, but it's far, far away, then it would be slow. I would think a small bird going fast must be closer to the window I am gazing out of. The word time is the most commonly used noun in English. The sneeze leaves the body, leaves the nose at 180 miles per hour. A useless fact. Chameleons launch their tongues at unsuspecting insects at speeds of 26 body lengths per second. The body falling from 35 feet up to an abrupt and dead land hits the ground at about 35 miles per hour. It doesn't continue to be a one-to-one -one correspondence the higher you go. What is an undetectably brief moment? Idea. The human can notice an event, a physical event, not heartbreak or sadness, but a physical event that happens within one-tenth of a second. When the time period advances or shortens to one two-thousandth of a second, such as an explosion, it, the event, becomes a blur, actually becomes an experience to the person perceiving it. Light travels one hundred and 80,000 times faster than rain. The smallest test tube is 10,000 times smaller than a human hair. Distance and time, according to Einstein, space-time, are inextricably connected. So you can't really talk about fast without thinking about distance, space, proportion, frame, and time. If you drilled a tunnel straight through the earth and jumped in, it would take you exactly 42 minutes and 12 seconds to get to the other side. How fast is that? Well, I guess it depends on the circumference of the earth. And then you could calculate it. You still may not want to do it. No scientific experiment has ever been done or could be done to prove that time exists. Lisa Randall would say, when asked, please define time, there's a problem with the minus sign. What does feeling fast mean? G-forces. The degree of force laid onto the body, often when you're thinking about shorter turning radiuses as the Chinese MIG pilots um, accomplished in, during World War II, so they could become more unpredictable and um, less able to be hit. However, the G-forces, what they were able to accomplish is to figure out in their brains how to handle those G-forces that no one else thought was physically possible. 
the degree of force laid onto the body, how fast, how can fast and force be perceived? Maybe not something you see, maybe something that happens to you, to the body. How do you make something happen to an audience, especially because they are sitting there doing nothing? Action must be made to be utterly extreme. Action is subject, not body is object. Use the idea of instant acceleration rather than having to reach speed, or its opposite, slow down. Remove all transitions and just do the move, just do the move. How we listen, how we see, how we feel, how we know. Faster, higher, harder, sooner. It's a lot about courage and foolishness and not knowing what's gonna happen, not planning, rather wondering. When you construct a physical moment, maybe the fact is if it's not fast, you'll all fall asleep. If it's not hard, you won't care. And my job is to figure out how to do the unpredictable next event in such a short amount of time that you won't look away. Fast. So I know that that video is a little bit graphic, but um, uh, and in case any of you are wondering, yes, I do share that video with my vegetarian friends, and and I, you get some pretty good reactions out of them too. So, um, but I, I show it for a reason because I think that it's important to to be in touch with your ingredients, to to know where your food is coming from, and I think to 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 turn a blind eye to you know whole animals and the graphic nature of it is is turning a blind eye to the whole process by which we create what we create on a daily basis. And I think that, you know, I'm here talking about slow food and food in general, 
Um, it's not uh, necessarily an organization that I've subscribed myself with from the, from the get-go. I mean, I know that people like Alice Waters and a lot of great chefs on the West Coast sort of pioneered this movement. Uh, a lot of respected colleagues in Italy that I've worked with have, have really pioneered the movement. And I think that, you know, I relate to it on a lot of levels, um, but I think the deepest level that I relate to it on is just the respect that chefs bring to the, the, their everyday work. And, and it starts with the, the, the materia prima, as we like to say. It's the, the, the raw materials the first things that we're using, um, and with, without which we could not create the dishes that we create on a daily basis. So we spend a lot of time at Myelino, and I think that all of my most respected colleagues in New York um, who have the ability to make an impact on, you know, sort of the economy and farming and agriculture, we, we take a lot of time getting to know the people that we're getting food from. And I think that's the most important thing that, that we try to accomplish on a daily basis is not to preach to people about slowing down because quite honestly in the restaurant we speed things up like crazy I mean, we would not be successful we would not be able to to sustain these farmers and keep buying pigs and fennel and uh whatever it is we're going to get from them if we didn't have a business to provide and so what we try to do on a daily basis is to figure out ways to yes take what is a slow food movement and you know this respect for tradition and pr proper farming practices proper cooking proper technique but find a way to kind of speed it up so that we can get more people in the game, so that more people can come through our doors on a daily basis. And um, that's the trick. And so we embrace speed, we embrace technology, we do a lot of crazy things like sous vide meat so that we can bar buy meat from a farmer on one day um, because they can't deliver to us every day and we can preserve it for an entire week through the process of sous vide. And also what we can do is we can then cook it in that bag. I don't know if any of you are out here familiar with sous vide cooking, but it's just one technique that we apply, which is sort of like, you know, uh, has fallen into this unfortunate, you know, sort of category of like the fad of molecular gastronomy. But I think that one of the things that molecular gastronomy and sous vide in particular have been able to provide for us is the ability to take this technology and extend the life of of, of a story, and the story for us is the story of the farmer who was able to, you know, raise a beautiful pig, or to be able to provide hand-picked, you know, baby kale to us on a regular basis. So, you know, we're in the business of of giving pleasure. There's no doubt about it. That's that's the bottom line. When people come through our door, what we're looking to do is to create what I like to call an essential experience for them, and that's something that we talk a lot about. I talk about that a lot with uh, my my boss and uh, uh, partner Danny Meyer, uh, who says we want anybody who comes in the door. Uh, to have uh, an essential experience, meaning that the experience goes beyond just the food. So the food is great, hopefully, and uh, what we've been able to do through the experience, though, is to make you feel as though somehow you've either learned something or have walked away from that plate or, and out the doors of a restaurant um, with your life a little bit better than it was before. Kind of like the analogy he likes to use is, is listening to a certain song, and, and you, know, you might have your favorite song, and that song is essential to you because you think to yourself, if that song did not exist and I didn't listen to that song or enjoy it through my lifetime, my life wouldn't be as, as cool as it is right now. So we try to, as best as we possibly can, it sounds like a lofty goal, but create essential experiences for people when they come into the restaurant. And that, that's really what, you know, how I think about slow food and, and what it's done for our game, the chef game. It's not necessarily a reaction against something or a reaction against you know, the McDonald's that opens up in the Spanish Steps, it's, it's more of a reaction for something, for creating, you know, better experiences, better practices, and doing things the right way. Thank you. Well, I want to hear from you all, because half of this is about you, your experience, your questions, your thoughts. One of the great things about these Aspen audiences is that we do attract very, very thoughtful people. So let's open it up. Do we need, do we have mics? Okay. Yeah. Uh, Chef Andrer, could you say a little more about just how you do sous vide cooking? <laughs> sure. I hope we don't bore you guys. Yeah, what is, what is it? <laughs> so essentially what sous vide cooking is, is when you take um, any product, and oftentimes it's meat. Um, S-O-U-S, it's French. S-O-U-S, under, and then vide, V-I-D-E. So it's, it's basically under, under pressure. It's, a, it's uh, cryovacking is essentially the way that we can refer to it in English, I guess. So what we do is we take cryovac bags, plastic bags, and then we put the meat inside the bag. Now, there's a couple of different things you could do. You could have, leave it alone and just vacuum seal it so it's airtight, 
for preservation. Other things you can do is you can actually season the meat and sort of, it's almost like uh, hyper-injecting a marinade into that meat if you put some sort of seasoning in there, cryovac it. And then what you can do with that bag, which is often done, is you can submerge the bag into a water bath, which is set to a specific temperature, which would be the doneness of the meat that you desire, and then leave it in that water bath very, very long time. So this is where the slow part comes in. Sometimes we do things like short ribs where you can put them in a bag and if you want a slow, soft cooked piece of meat, then you set it to 66 degrees Celsius and you let it go for 10 to 12 hours overnight. And then you come back the next day, it's perfectly soft. You can then either serve it right away or you can chill it down in an ice bath. And oftentimes with uh, particular kinds of meats that we use in the restaurant, chicken, I can use that as an example because we sell a ton of chicken at Mylino. You, we do go through that process, we cook the chicken, we chill the chicken so that when a guest comes in and they order the chicken, instead of waiting 35 minutes that it takes to roast the chicken, all we have to do is re-thermalize that, that chicken that has been cooked and chilled to perfect temperature and then crisp up the skin and you serve it. And it's a six, six minute cook time as opposed to a 35 minute cooking process. Not to mention the benefits you get from the preservation of, of the chickens because we get from a specific farmer who can only deliver once a week and you know the chicken would spoil by the, the fourth or fifth day or at least not be as nice as it was on the first day and the sous vide helps to preserve it in that, in that respect. Mm. Let, let's go on the other side of the room. Any, any, any remarks or questions over here? Um, I'm a big fan of both slow art and slow looking and, and slow food, but I wonder if those concepts are meaningful without a society that's somehow more just. That is, it's all very well for Arden to spend time in a museum because he has time to spend in a museum, you know, two hours looking at one picture, and it's all very well to eat at Maialino um, when you can afford however much it costs, $100 for a meal, $150 for a meal. But does any of that really make sense unless we can make it a more egalitarian society where people have the money and the time to do that, everyone? has the money and the time to, to kick back and spend two hours looking at a painting. Does slowness make sense as a mandate if it's only an activity for the well-heeled? Well, I, I wonder if there's anybody in the audience who wants to respond to that. <laughs> has anybody else been sort of thinking about that type of thing? This is an annexation to that question. If, with lots of um, talent and seriousness, you produce slow or fast art or food or entertainment. For it to be um, fully appreciated, is it incumbent upon you to communicate um, the labor involved um, in, the, in the process, which in some cases uh, translates into time, like the gentleman said, or money spent. Um, so there's a relationship between input and you know the artist input, maybe, and the consumer's uh, I'm digestion? Not, I'm not sure. I mean, in a way, I think your question is a little bit about appreciation, but what about justice? How, how, does that, how does that question that we just got about needing a just society for any of what we're talking about here to be relevant, does that, how does that strike any of you? Well, I, I think the art world is, is, you know, situated in a more elitist fiscal um, plateau. I mean, there's no question about that. It, not talking about the pro-am movement, professional amateur movement, or talking about arts and crafts, but I think that um, especially here in these United States, we can establish a new format for the distribution of the making of it. The first 20 years you get to do R&D and invent your system, and then someone somehow comes in and figures out how to get it to the every person. I think that's yet to be done. But I'm not sure that question is really about uh, disseminating our art. I mean, I think it's a question, uh, 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 I hear that question as being about, it's very well for us, to, I mean, even for you to do fast stuff, you have to have people who have uncompromised bodies, uh, who are trained, so it's very well for us here to talk uh, even about this concept, but there are many people you're suggesting who are even outside of that context who wouldn't have the time to go back to a Manet, as you did over many, many years at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, or spend time at the Roden um, Crater, uh, uh, or sit at Mylino, or any of the places where you have cooked. Would, 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 would you say something? Uh, I, I never thought that I would think about art education, and now <laughs> I find I think about it a lot. So. I have no figures about this, and maybe people in, in this room know better than I, but my 
sense is that in all sorts of schools serving many different communities across socioeconomic range, kids are taken into museums. And there, this happens, I think, not just once, but repeatedly over the course of their time in school. So it's not that it's impossible for anybody who isn't rich to look at art. They're exposed to art a lot from early on. Oh, I think people would say that's not the case right really? now. Oh, I think we're Is in a it? crisis, really. Okay. Is it, are there any arts educators in the room? Will you say something about that? In public schools? Post-secondary. Post-secondary. I mean, I think, I, I, you know, I, I think that uh, uh, if there's nobody here from K, in K through 12 at all, what what is, uh, uh, private school or public school? Uh, in New York, I teach at a private school, and in California, I taught in the public schools. In the public schools, in never, the last we never went in. We never had money to go into any museums. I think that was a case, but I think one of the crises facing us right now is there's not money in the that actually arts education in public schools is gone. I mean, the public schools are such a disaster right now that, you know, in Philadelphia, for example, they just dismissed all the nurses and all the guidance counselors. So they're certainly not, you know, doing art. But one of the things, I, I thank you for that question. I don't think we have an answer today uh, for you, but it's a really wonderful question. Um, one of the things that I think you all three have in common is uh, something that you, you, a word you used a lot, Nick, when you were talking is, you're all either about uh, giving an experience or having an experience. And I wonder, um, for example, Arden, how you think about um, Elizabeth's idea that in her case, doing it, she has to do, make the event happen so fast that the audience won't look away. Or she said, you also talked about the audience doing nothing. And I wonder what, uh, what keeps you engaged with Manet? Why do you go back over and over again or did you go back over and over again? What keeps you engaged with uh, Sarah or, or Terrell? I mean, is there something else that can engage us other than the fact of quickness of grabbing our attention? What else could keep our attention? I'm perverse. Um, and I, I, I don't mean that entirely as, as a joke. Um, I mean, first of all, it, exactly as Blake says, I, I have a, a steady job, and it gives me a lot of time off. And so it, it is physically, geographically, spatially, temporally possible for me to do this. But I think really what, what it was about is, OK, put it this way. I was one of Jacques Derrida's early American students. My first book was a study of the weather in romantic literature. And it was all about texts. Um, I knew everything that anybody ever knew about clouds in, in Coleridge and, and Baudelaire. And it wasn't until after the book was finished that I actually went to the Lake District. And hot damn, there was the weather. You got up in the morning and it smacked you in the face. It was a real empirical phenomenon. And it made me realize how deracinated my education had been, how high theory was dusty, OK? And so when I had that experience with, with the Max Beckmann triptych, which was an embodied experience, but the funny thing is, I think, and I'll use this word because I don't have a better one, and put it in scare quotes if you want and not if you don't. It was a kind of embodied spiritual experience. It spoke to my needs in ways that other things didn't. And so when I would go back to Manet's Woman with a Parrot, it wasn't exactly like I was going to worship um, the Virgin and a dove, right? But it was a kind of secular equivalent of that. I found a sort of a sort of contemplation, a sort of peace. Uh, and the fact that I could take my time and that I could ask the work something and that the work would answer me. And then I could come back with another question and the work would come back with another answer. And that I could share that with people. That was a moving experience for me. I don't know if that answers your question. But that's, mm -hmm. Well, that's it, it, it's a dialogue that you're talking yeah. about that exists. Nick, what do you think makes people keep coming back to Maialino or any other place? And also, I just want to mention one thing, uh, Blake. Blake, uh, is that, for example, uh, as we've both alluded to, in the West Coast, a lot of some of the slow food uh, uh, in France as well, in Italy. Uh, but one of the things that Alice Waters has done, to her credit, in addition to having a very fine restaurant in Berkeley, and I'm actually a, a part of this mission of hers, um, she has the Edible Schoolyard. 
Um, and that's the type of thing we can do with our resources. And I've seen that schoolyard, and it's amazing. I mean, she took a broken down parking lot and turned it into a place where children can eat out of a pizza oven and, and come into a broken down chemistry lab and, and, and talk about things and, and be the understand a table as a place that's not just for food, but where you do have an experience. What, what, what are the other things that, what caused people to come back other than the food, would you well, say? Well, if I could address Blake first, too, because I think it's an important thing to address from a food perspective. Uh, it, it is, uh, I think, an obligation of ours as you know, privileged individuals in this uh, restaurant industry, and particularly at the successful restaurants such as ours, to, to reach out more and to, to, to make sure that the experience goes beyond the four walls of the space. And Edible Schoolyard is a great example of that. We contribute to, to their cause quite a bit and have done um, 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 active fundraisers and participations with them. But I think that uh, even more important is reaching out to your communities and reaching out to, so for example, in, Grammar, in the Gramercy Park neighborhood, we've reached out to p several public schools in that area to have the kids come in and actually see these ingredients from their raw state and not necessarily with the pig, but with, you know, uh, but handling... they'd be fascinated with that pig. They, yeah, some of them would be. <laughs> others, others would be pretty shocked. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think that the, the earlier they get that exposure and the earlier they can see the, the labor that goes into this and they can understand the story behind it, they're going to start thinking about that story themselves. And as, as I, hopefully they get more and more educated on it, they grow up wondering where all that crap in their supermarket's coming from. Um, and, and that's when I think you start, you start to make an impact, is when you start reaching out to the community beyond the four walls. Um, but in terms of like getting people to come back to Myelino, I mean, there, there are a number of reasons why people come back. I mean, some people just want to have the carbonara. But I mean, I think that what, what we are trying to do is, is to create um, uh, an experience that, that, that lasts longer than the, the, the 10 minutes that it takes to finish a bowl of pasta. And so we do that not just through food, but through the extension of hospitality, through giving a figurative hug to people as they come through the door. And I think that one of the best things you can say about any restaurant is that they made me feel comfortable and they made me want to go back, right? And I think that's what we try to try to, try to do. And, and, and there's, there's so many different ways at it, but I think it's all about being inquisitive about the guests and making each experience feel unique, you know, to make them feel like they're back at grandma's kitchen table. Um, and that, that's really what makes, uh, uh, for me at least, a restaurant experience special, and that's what we strive to do when people come in our door. Now, Strab, I, I realize too, when I think about, you know, Blake's question, it really is very intriguing. I mean, now part of your mission for all that, you know, you talk about the fastness, you know, the, it has to happen so fast you won't look away. On the other hand, think about that story you told me about the mirror that you had in Brooklyn that caused the prostitutes to come by and take a look at themselves. I mean, there is something very essential in the way that you think about SLAM that is, is, is about a, a broad kind of engagement with a neighborhood. Why don't you talk about those prostitutes in the mirror? Oh, the prostitutes, uh, um, well, first I wanted to just, yes, I'll talk about the prostitutes. Um, we're at SLAM, by the way, it's a public place. You're all invited. It was, it was birthed from, well, the city, I think that could be the woman that helped me. Is that Kate Levin? No. no. Kate Levin, yes. Um, yes, she is. I saw her. She tried to hide, but I wouldn't let her. Um, You're very tall, Kate. There, is, where is she? Is she right there? She's hiding. She really is. Ho okay. However, what, what I wanted to say was, you know, we, we were in seven different garages. One was in bed that did have this, you know, people heard there's a dance company was there, and do you want to buy a mirror? And we said, I don't look in the mirror. I don't believe in it. you got to stop to look in the mirror. Who cares how you look? Where, you know, normal dance will have you look in the mirror all the time. I'm thinking, well, you've got to stop. That's time consuming. Um, so I said, no, no, I don't need a mirror. And they leaned it outside, apparently, and then days later, I saw these women taking a look at themselves in the mirror, and I'm like, wow, that's really viral, right? And they were probably, um, anyway, I don't know if they were homeless or not, but they started coming in because it was always open to the public. It was our first um, experiment. And, uh, and, and, I, and I realized, anyway, long story short, was that one thing led to another, completely completely viral, word of mouth, got out, we had a mirror, then that they could come in, that we had bathrooms, unplanned, just, um, unplanned uh, construction of a public garage. 
and it was a garage because you could make it messy. It wasn't fancy. And then we finally got to Slam, and Kate Levin was really instrumental in allowing us to now own that property. But I wanted to say that how you attract people without like having to educate them, I'm sort of against education, like, but you attract them because they want to come in. And then once they're in, they can do whatever they want, even if it's just to have their lunch. And I think that the notion of context, not what you're doing, like the restaurant, the food, but, or how much it costs, but the fact of the matter is, how do you create a context that is actually public? And that examine that your money is actually coming from taxpayers' money, by, in large part and that you need to make that place public. I, I don't know if that's true in your restaurant and I, in, in museums. I don't really like to go in museums because of the context, separate from the pictures. Oh, well. Oh, oh, good. I'm glad we have some hands. We have about five minutes left. So, yes, you, sir, with the, with the uh, hair on your face and the glasses. <laughs> Thank you. It's, uh, it's a quick comment and a quick question to Chef Nick, perhaps talking about social uh, change. Gourmet for all movement should be begun by chefs where it's not about performativity of class for people who are not able to, to access this, but it's more about the sensorial experiences that gourmet eating usually offers to certain people, not to the others. The other thing is to um, um, choreographer Streb. Um, coming from Egypt, where I come from, we talk a lot uh, in, in performance theory about repetition and score making and improvisation and why a lot of performance practices in the Arabic speaking region generally are improvisation based not score based and we were wondering if this has to do with the luxury of time and space and I was very interested to hear from you about time and uh, that there is no particular that time is the word that we mention a lot but at the same time to exactly define what time is is very hard so if you could reflect a bit on improvisation and extreme action in relation to time. Okay, short answer. I, I don't think, I think improvisation works great with jazz and sound. You can't go fast enough to improvise extreme action. Thank you. you can't go fast enough to improvise extreme action. No, I, 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 don't, I don't want to, no, because you're making it up as you go along, and our seconds are split into hundreds of seconds. You can't count it. And so if you're like with someone, even contact improv, I never really liked watching that. I mean, if you're having fun, I'm happy for you. But uh, as an audience, I don't really want to watch people physically improvise. I, I'd like to hear what you... Okay, uh, one last question, and then uh, Jessica. Jessica is one of my students. I'm surprised they, a bunch of them showed up. I'm very pleased from NYU. <laughs> Um, I, I also, I, I used to be a dancer, and one of the ways that I would train is that if I could do something slow, then I could do it fast. If I could do it fast, it didn't mean I could do it slow. So I would, I would divide up my movement and go about it really, really slowly in order to then later be able to do it really fast to master those transitions. And, and then I was just thinking about with education, I, if we had more patience, like uh, I was also told by my choreographer that it was good to take the long road, to take a long time to learn something, because then I'd know it really deeply. So in terms of social justice, I'm just wondering this, this or even with movement, like this idea that if, if we can allow more time to learn something and, and go deeper into the details, that that would allow us to be faster in a more efficient way. And if, if you guys have any comments about that, sort of the dynamic relationship between slow and fast, um, Kind of like preserving the meat, and then you're able to serve it in six minutes. Um, so, yeah. I'm, I'm, I, uh, Jessica was a teacher of mine. I took yoga from her at Pomona. So, oh, wow. So we go back. Um, but I, I actually I was hoping that somebody would a allow me to to quote Calvino here. This is Italo uh, Calvino. Uh, Italo Calvino. This was uh, an anecdote from his Harvard lectures. And, it, and it's about the interdependence of fast and slow, and it's really exactly to your point, Jessica. Among Chuance's many skills, he was an expert draftsman. The king asked him to draw a crab. Chuance replied that he needed five years, a country house, and 12 servants, speaking of equality. Um, five years later, the drawing was still not begun. I need another five years, said Chuance. The king granted them. At the end of these 10 years, Chuanza took up his brush, and in an instant, with a single stroke, he drew a crab, the most perfect crab ever seen. Well, that's a little bit of chance visits the prepared mind, too, right? <laughs> yeah, right. It, 
Things take time. All of the things that we do take time. The result may appear to be slow or fast, but it takes time and it takes care. Uh, and I suppose um, that's really maybe something that's worth thinking about, back to that idea of the elevator, is are we moving so fast that we've lost the ability to take care? Those of us up here in an aesthetic lives where we're required to take care no matter, again, what happens in the end. But are we in the world moving so quickly that we are losing touch with the uh, ability to take care? Thank you so much. Take care of yourselves as you leave. Thank you for being with us. <laughs>